Hello, everyone. Nice to see you all. Welcome to session nine of our course about the foremost theories of old. Today, we are talking about Bada Kundala Kesa Bikuni, and she is the Bikuni foremost in swiftness of wisdom. So, the one who attained Arahanship the fastest. And um, just a little disclaimer before we start I just traveled from Sri Lanka to the US. So I'm super jet lagged. And if I'm a little bit spaced out today, then this is the reason. So hopefully it will all go well, but we have to see what happens. I'm really very tired. So um, as usual, we can start with the Namotasa and feel free to join me if you like. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Udang Damang Sangang Namasami So I'll share my screen as usual and then we can dive right in. So as mentioned today, we are talking about Vadakunda Lakesa. And um, what I want to do today is I want to go through the different historical strata and look at her text and her story and see how that evolves over time, especially in the Pali tradition. So we're going to look at her Tirigata verse first. And in connection with that, we are going to look at a special form of ordination, which is called the Ehi Bikuni ordination or the Kam Bikuni ordination, which is a very early form of ordination and became very controversial for women in later times, especially in the Pali tradition. So we're going to explore a little bit what's happening there. And then we're going to look at her story in the Pali Apadanas, which are a few centuries after uh, her Terigata verse, and then her story in the Dhammapada commentary, which is a commentary written by Buddha Gosa roughly a thousand years after the Buddha's time. And uh, when we've done that, we are going to compare that a little bit with her story in the Chinese, the Kotada Agama. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and uh, that's of course a completely different school of Buddhism. And we will see that her story there is also very, very different. And I believe that text hasn't been translated into a Western language so far. So we are having uh, a little um, special treat today with that story from the Chinese. And uh, as I mentioned already, she is the nun who is foremost uh, among those with a swift insight. Uh, and that uh, is consistent across all the different texts, all the different lists that we have. Uh, the Kotara Agama says that she is foremost among those who attain final realization. Uh, which is obviously the same thing, just phrased a little bit differently. And T126, uh, the other Chinese list, also says that she is the foremost among the disciples who can swiftly attain the goal, which of course is Arahanship. So the traditions are fairly consistent um, with her foremost quality. And uh, now let's uh, have a look at her Tirigata verse, uh, which is Tirigata 5.9, and we are using Bhante Sujato's translation. And uh, we're going to read the poem first and then uh, talk about it in more detail. My hair mown off, covered in mud, I used to wander wearing just one robe. I saw fault where there was none and no fault where there was. Leaving my day's meditation on Vulture's Peak Mountain, I saw the stainless Buddha at the fore of the mendicant Sangha. I bent my knee and bowed, and in his presence raised my joint palms. Come, Bada, he said. That was my ordination. 
I've wandered among the Angans and Magadans, the Vajis, Khasis, and Kothalans. I have eaten the arms food of the nations, free of debt for 50 years. Oh, he has made so much merit. The lay follower is so very wise. He gave a rope to Bada, who is released from all ties. So here we have uh, Bada telling us her story in her own words. So her own testimony of how she lived, how she got ordained, how she practiced. Um, and uh, in the beginning, in the first stanza, she uh, talks about the practices she did before she became a Buddhist nun. And she wasn't a lay person before that, she was a non-Buddhist ascetic. Very likely she was a Jain ascetic, so the practices she mentions here are very likely Jain practices, or if not Jain, then they're very close to Jain practices. And also the Jain tradition itself uh, maintains uh, a story or the idea that Bata Kundalakesa was one of their nuns. So we have uh, evidence, independent evidence from uh, different sources that point us towards the fact that she very likely was a Jain nun before she joined the Buddhist Sangha. So uh, she says, my hair mown off. Um, um, so plucking out the hair is a form of the Jain um, ordination ceremony, a special um, form, a, a special austere or severe form of uh, ordination in the Jain tradition where they rip out the hair one by one, which is of course uh, quite painful. And um, that's the point of the ceremony, it's supposed to be painful. And um, that's also where she got the name from. So her name Kundalakesa means curly hair. Uh, and that's because when they ripped out the hair, it grew back in curls and then she, became, uh, she, she got the name curly hair. And uh, for the people who are more familiar with the Sri Lankan tradition, in the Sri Lankan tradition, her, her name is Kundalakesi instead of Kundalakesa. So that's um, just a spelling variant. So if you're familiar with that name, it's, it's the same person, the same name. Um, and she says covered in mud. So again, that's a Jane practice, not washing. Um, and she used to wonder wearing just one rope. So wearing one rope, again, points us towards the Jane. Uh, in the Jane tradition, there are basically um, Two options for, for monks, which is either to be completely naked or to wear one robe. Uh, for, the nun, for the Jain nuns, there is no option. They, they're not allowed to be completely naked. They have to wear one robe. And uh, that's obviously for protection from sexual assault. Um, so uh, again, all this points us towards the Jain. And then she says that she had wrong view. Like from, from the later Buddhist perspective, of course, she had wrong view. She saw that practices were faulty, that were actually pure, and uh, vice versa. Um, but she was a very dedicated practitioner, obviously. She was meditating on the Vajra Peak Mountain, doing Jain meditation, obviously. And then she sees the Buddha and the Sangha, and immediately, even though she's a Jain nun, she's not Buddhist, immediately she bows down to the Buddha and uh, pays respect to him. And immediately when the Buddha sees him, he, he says, come Buddha and ordains her like this. So they have this a very close heart-to-heart -heart connection in her own story. And this immediate mutual recognition, she immediately recognizes uh, the, uh, the, the, Buddha, um, the Buddha's qualities and he immediately recognizes her as a prime candidate for ordination. And she doesn't even have to ask. He basically, she bows down and he ordains her straight away. So I, I think this is the only story where that happens so quickly. Um, this, this like immediate mutual recognition. Um, and of course, uh, he says, come Bada, and that was her ordination. So in Pali, this is Ehi Bade. And this, of course, uh, points us towards the Ehi Bikuni or Ehi Biku ordination. And uh, that is a very early form of ordination. Um, so we know in the, in the very early days of the Sangha, the Buddha did all ordinations by himself. And um, he, of course, didn't do any elaborate ceremonies or anything. If somebody wanted to join the Sangha, he just said, come bhikkhu or come bhikkhuni. Uh, so in, in verse text, it's usually just come bhikkhu or come bhikkhuni. In the prose text, it's a little bit more elaborate. Uh, the Buddha adds, um, the Dhamma is well proclaimed. 
live the holy life for the complete destruction of suffering. Um, so that is the entire ordination ceremony in the early times. But then, of course, over time, uh, it, when the Sangha was wandering around and Buddhism became more well known, it, and the, the area that they covered was much wider, it became very impractical for people to always wander back to the Buddha if there was a new candidate who wanted to ordain. So then the Buddha gave the allowance to the Sangha to ordain themselves. Um, and that's when the more elaborate procedures started to uh, form. The first one was to, uh, was to do ordination by going for the triple refuge to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, which is still the way we are doing Samanera and Samaneri Pabaja ordination today. And then later the, the whole um, very elaborate procedures for bhikkhu and bhikkhuni ordination that we have nowadays emerged. Um, but the early, the early version of doing ordination by the Buddha himself was this ehi bhikkhu and ehi bhikkhuni ordination. And in later tradition, this kind of ordination became very much um, mythologized. It was accompanied by many, many miracles. And at that point, then later tradition started to claim that only bhikkhus could have this kind of ordination. Bhikkhunis could not have this ordination. Because of all the miracles that occur, you need to have a lot of merit to be able to undergo such an ordination. And they claim that women did not have enough merit and therefore they couldn't undergo this kind of ordination. Um, but here, I mean, clearly in this text, we, I mean, the, the nun in her own words states that she had this kind of ordination. So clearly we have one testimony that this ordination happened. Um, we also have in our Pali Theravada Vinaya, where we have a definition of what a bhikkhuni is and how you can become a bhikkhuni. And in that list, it mentions all the different forms of ordination that you can go through in order to become a bhikkhuni. And one of the forms that I mentioned there is also this ehi bhikkhuni ordination. So here, this um, poem is, is not actually the only place where we find ehi bhikkhuni ordination for women. But later, the commentary goes through great length to redefine all these passages. So for this passage here, it says that the Buddha didn't actually say, come, Buddha. He said, go, Buddha, to the bhikkhunis and get ordained there. Uh, and the passage in the Vinaya, um, the Buddha says, uh, sorry, the commentary says that... Um, there is a theoretical possibility that women could potentially undergo this kind of ordination. But in Gautama Buddha's dispensation, no woman actually had enough merit to actually have that. So even though it's theoretically possible, in, pract in practice, that didn't really happen. Um, so that's, of course, very interesting. And, and, there, like, and the reason for that, as I mentioned, is all the miracles that are supposed to happen around this ordination. For example, it is said that if you have this ordination, then automatically all your hair will fall off. So your, your shaven had it like um, automatically and all your robes or your clothes will transform into Buddhist robes by miracle. And you will automatically have the appearance of a senior elder of so-and-so many vasa, so-and-so many years seniority in the Sangha. And um, um, all the requisites that you need for monastic life will pop up and appear on your body out of nowhere. So according to later tradition, monastics need eight requisites. According to later Pali tradition, monastics need eight requisites. In, in Chinese traditions, there's a different number of requisites. Uh, so that there's three robes, your belt, your bowl, um, your razor, your needle and thread, and your water filter. And all this will pop up out of nowhere if you have this um, come bhikkhu or come bhikkhuni ordination. So that, that is the miraculous thing that's supposed to happen. Of course, in earlier times, we have no such idea of, uh, of all these miracles. It's just like a very plain, simple thing that the Buddha says. And at that point, the person is ordained. And when we look at this in comparative perspective, of course, uh, we see that the that um, other Buddhist schools have a lot more instances of these ehi bhikkhuni ordinations. So uh, the idea that um, this is something that didn't happen is really, uh, really easy. Like it's, it's a myth that is really, really easy to debunk when you look, uh, at, uh, look at this in comparative perspective. 
So ubiquinin ordination is mentioned in many other vineyard texts. And we also have many other stories of bhikkhunis um, being ordained with this ehi bhikkhuni formula. For example, in the Avadana Shataka that we read a few times, uh, that French text uh, that we used, in that text we have seven nuns who undergo this ehi bhikkhuni ordination. And then there is a very well known story um, uh, of the Chandala girl Pakirti who undergoes this ehi bhikkhuni ordination, who becomes very famous for this. Um, there is, of course, um, Bada Kapilani, Mahakasapa's wife, um, undergoes Ehi Bikuni ordination in the Mulasavasivada tradition. In the Pali tradition, her story is very, um, very interesting. Actually, we are going to have a session about Bada Kapilani, so I'm not going too much into detail. But uh, according to the Pali tradition, she and Mahakasapa go forth at the same time because they're married. And um, they go forth very, very early in the first year of the Buddha's dispensation. And um, Mahakasapa encounters the Buddha straight away and becomes ordained, but Bata Kapilani cannot be ordained because according to the later tradition, there is no Bikuni Sangha at that point. So she is uh, she actually stay, stays in a non-Buddhist nunnery and just waits her time until the Buddha and Mahapajapati do found the Bikuni Sangha. And then she gets ordained according to the Pali tradition. But according to um, other traditions, she actually uh, gets ordained straight away with the Ehi Bikuni formula. So she's a very, very early nun in the other traditions. Um, so we have many, many instances of this Ehi Bikuni ordination. We have even one instance where um, Mahapajapati herself ordains somebody with Ehi Bikuni. So she ordains um, Kema, Kema the nun foremost in wisdom, the female counterpart of Sariputta. The chief nun um, is ordained by Mahapajapati with Ehi Bhikkhuni, which is, of course, very interesting because uh, normally only the Buddha has the power to do the Ehi ordinations. And other Sangha members, have, if they want to ordain, have to use the more elaborate procedures. But here, Mahapajapati has a power to do Ehi ordinations, uh, which is almost, um, almost on the level of a Buddha. And no other monk or no other nun has this power, but Mahapajapati is able to do this kind of ordination for Kema. So that is a very, um, very unusual, very interesting passage there. Uh, so anyway, this Ehi ordination is very well attested in the um, non-Pali sources. But in the Pali tradition, this becomes extremely controversial because women are supposed to not have enough merit and when we look at Bata's story uh, in the next few historical layers of text, we are going to uh, see um, what happens to her ordination story also. And then uh, she continues uh, that she has wandered among all these uh, various different countries, various different people. So all around the central Ganges plain. So she seems to have been a very active, uh, none also she doesn't mention wandering with a companion so um yeah she seems to have been quite um quite tough and especially because she was a jain nun before uh, obviously being a buddhist nun then um it's, it's much easier and uh, if you're used to that the tough love tough life of a jain nun then um wandering around all, all over the country all over the place of course isn't very difficult for you anymore and um she says that she's eaten the arms food of the nations free of debt for 50 years. So that's um, very interesting also as well. Um, and the metaphor is, uh, to eat the arms food of the nations free of debt, that means being an arahant. Um, I'm a little conscious of time, so I'm not uh, going to explain that metaphor in detail. If you want me to explain in more detail, please ask a question later. But definitely this means being an arahant. And that's interesting. Uh, because we know that the Buddha only taught for 45 years. So the Buddha attained enlightenment at 35 and he um, entered Parinibbana at 80. So he taught for 45 years. And even if Buddha was a very early nun, let's say even if she was ordained in the first year of his dispensation, still that means that she, um, that she lived uh, longer and she survived his Parinibbana by at least five years. 
And um, of course, that's interesting because we have discussed about this a few times already. The idea that most or many of the nuns did not want to live on after the Buddha's Parinibbana and that they all entered Parinibbana first, just before the Buddha's Parinibbana. We've seen that especially uh, with Mahapajapati and her Apadana stories. And there it seemed that um, a vast number of nuns um, passed away together, all the teachers, all the leaders of the Sangha and a, a good number of the, the, the regular nuns. So it seemed that the Sangha, the Bhikkhuni Sangha was in a very weak state uh, after the Buddha's um, passing away. But here we have the testimony of uh, Vada Kundala Kesa, who says that she was still alive and that she continued to wander and to teach. And, I mean, she doesn't say that she teach, teaches, but if you wander around, that, that sort of implies that you teach um, after this period still. So she is one of the nuns who seem to have still been around at that point. And then here in the last center, she uh, rejoices uh, in the merit of a lay follower. And that is very interesting because it reverses the gender roles, um, of course, that were prevalent at that time. So they're talking about making a rope and giving a rope. So all this sewing and stitching and so on, that's obviously usually an activity that is female gendered. And then also supporting another person. Also, that's usually something that is female gendered, giving support, usually to a male. It's usually something that is female gendered in, in these old texts. But here we have a male lay follower supporting a female monastic. And she is rejoicing in that and praising that kind of activity, which goes like so much uh, against the established gender norms. And I think that is why she includes that into her poem. Um, so uh, she, she's really praising that reversal of gender roles here. And these last two stanzas are stanzas that are unique to her poem. They're not, um, not picked up again in later tradition. Uh, so they're not, they don't recur in her apadana or they don't recur in her uh, commentarial text, her commentarial story. So they're only here, found here in her poem. Um, Maybe because this was a little bit controversial or maybe because people just didn't think it was that important. So this is her um, poem, her own testimony with her, where she uh, talks about this direct heart to heart connection that she had with the Buddha. And now we are moving on to her um, Apadana text. Um, and this text is very long, so I've shortened it very much. And I'm also going to go through it a little bit quickly uh, to save a little bit of time. And so she received the prediction for the, her future status as a foremost nun, the foremost, foremost among those with a swiftness of insight. Uh, as usual, as all the other nuns also under Padumutara, Buddha 100,000 eons ago. And then she had a lot of uh, good rebirths. And then she became one of the seven daughters of King Kiki and the Kasapa Buddha. So we've talked about them before, the seven daughters or the seven sisters or the seven princesses who became all, uh, all the foremost nuns in um, Gautama, Buddha's time. And uh, yeah, we also thought about having a session about the seven daughters in our course. So maybe you can think about if you want that. And then in the end, during question and answer, we can decide whether or not we want to have that session. Um, but the, the option is still there to have that session. And uh, now she is telling her, uh, her story in her final life. And she says, and now in my final rebirth in Giribaja, best city. So Giribaja is another name for Rajagaha. I was born to rich millionaires. When I become a young woman attracted to a thief, I saw being led to execution, my father paying a thousand had him freed from execution. After that, discerning my mind, my father gave me to that thief. So she's a young woman. She falls in love with a thief. He blackmails her parents. She threatens to kill herself if she doesn't get married to the guy. So the parents bribe uh, the ex executioner and he is freed, he's released and they get married. And she says, I was trustworthy for him and extremely kindly and friendly. He out of greed for my jewels, that enemy with ill intent led me to the thief's 
precipice on a mountain, plotting murder. So even though she was very friendly to him, to her husband, uh, he was still a thief and he was greedy for her jewels and wanted to kill her. So he brought her to a cliff on a mountain. Here in this text, it's, it's called the thief's precipice. I think usually it's more well known as robber's cliff. So robber's cliff and thief's precipice is the same place, obviously. And then stretching out to Satuka, hands which were well pressed together, protecting my own breath of life, I spoke these words to him just then. So Satuka is the name of the husband, the, the thief. This bracelet, which is made of gold, containing many pearls and gems. Sir, carry all this away. Announce that I'm your bed slave. Take it off, a beautiful one, and do not feel a lot of grief. I'm unable to accept wealth that I did not kill to get. For as long as I remember, ever since I reached discretion, I have accepted no other more beloved than you to me. So she wants to protect her own life and just tells him to just pack away all the jewels. Uh, no need to kill her. But he says, no, uh, he can't accept it unless he kills her. Um, so that didn't work out. Um, and then she changes her strategy and says, Come here, having embraced you, just one more circumambulation. And after now, there will, be, there will not be intercourse between you and me. So she um, wants to embrace him one last time. She wants to circumambulate him, which is a form of showing respect to somebody who is more senior. So she, as the wife here, shows respect to her husband. Uh, and just as, kind of as a farewell gesture before she dies. Uh, and the poem continues, the man is not the one who is wise in every single circumstance, paying attention here and there, the woman is the one who is wise. The man is not the one who is wise in every single circumstance, quick thinking with good strategy, the woman is the one who is wise. Quickly, in, quickly indeed, in just a flash, I came up with a clever trick, like a deer by a mighty bow, Satuka was slaughtered by me. Who fails to quickly understand the circumstances that arise, he gets murdered, that silly thief, in the belly of a mountain. So, um, here again we see the praise of her wisdom. So even in like mundane matters, she was quite smart, quite quick thinking. And of course that then lead, uh, lays the basis for her quick attainment of arahanship because her wisdom faculty was so strong already. And basically she circumambulated him and when she was behind him, she pushed him off the cliff and saved her own life and killed the husband. Um, yeah, who does not fail to quickly grasp the circumstances that arise? She is freed from creaturely bonds, such was I from Satuka then. Then I made him, Satuka, fall from a treacherous mountain road and coming into the presence of some white clad adept, I went forth. So she kills her husband and then she's very, um, um, well, disillusioned with life because her, her, uh, her one and only love and the person she saved from death tried to kill her. And of course, she also felt ashamed towards her parents because um, she, she blackmailed them and now she, she got this bad result. And um, so she decides not to go back to lay life and she joins a non-Buddhist group of ascetics. And here again, it seems like these are Jain ascetics because it says they're wearing white. And uh, in the Jain tradition, white is not the, uh, it's also the color of lay people, but it's also the color of the monastic robe uh, because white is their color of purity. And uh, we again see her ordination ceremony. Then after plucking out my hair altogether using tweezers, being ordained in no long time, they detailed their own tradition. So she has the same ordination ceremony with the plucking out of the hair. Um, and because she's very wise, she quickly learns their tradition. Then after I had learned all that, gone off by myself, sitting down, I thought about that tradition. Then a dog brought a human hand, chewed off, and after dropping it in my vicinity, ran off. Seeing that maggoty hand, I took it up for meditation. Then producing deep emotion, I, I asked my co-religionists, they said, the Shakyan Buddhist monks know the answer to your questions. So um, she's uh, contemplating the Jain, Jain um, teachings, but then she uh, receives this Asuba object, that, that human hand, 
And when she, uh, she reflects on that hand, she has some deep feelings coming up. I assume something about death contemplation or um, yeah, the, the undesirability of, of um, whatever the body or something. It's not quite clear what kind of meditation she's doing, but it's kind of whatever you can do based on a human hand. So I think um, must be some kind of a super practice or death contemplation. Uh, and she doesn't find an answer to her questions that arise in her uh, in the um, Jain teaching. And so she asks the other nuns and they themselves point her towards the Buddhists here. Um, and then she says, I'll ask that meaning approaching the followers of the Buddha. Taking me along, they all went into the best Buddha's presence. He preached the Dhamma to me, the heaps. In the thoughts, fears, and elements, the leader taught unpleasantness, impermanence, this is no self. After hearing his Dhamma, I then purified the Dhamma I. So she becomes a stream enterer. Learned in the good teaching, I asked to go forth and be ordained. At that time, he said this to me, come lucky one, said the leader. So lucky one is the translation of her name. The name Buddha means lucky one. So again, Buddha says, ehi bate just as he did in her own poem. Then being fully ordained, I saw a little bit of water. Okay, so here we see uh, the story of her meeting the Buddha is uh, in some way similar, but also substantially different from her own story. She no longer has this immediate heart-to-heart -heart connection with the Buddha. Instead, it is other people who have to point her towards the Buddha, and then they all go in a big group. And then also there's not this immediate reconnection, uh, reconnect uh, um, yeah, um, um, oh, my, my brain froze. There, there's no immediate connection between the two. Um, um, and the Buddha has to teach her in quite some detail various uh, aspects of the teaching um, before she actually, and then she asks to, to be ordained and then she gets ordination. So it's no longer that she, she just bows down and the Buddha straight away ordains her, but there is quite an elaborate um, procedure that have happened and she needs quite a bit of teaching and so on before she actually does ask to be ordained. Um, so she's, she becomes a little bit more removed from the Buddha and this immediate uh, connection that they had in her own poem is no longer there. So she, she needs a little bit more help, more support from the Buddha before she see, sees the teaching and before she then gets ordained. But her Ehi ordination is still there. So at this point, even though this is a few centuries later, Ehi Bhikkhuni was not yet something that was, um, that was questionable for women. So at this point, it, it seems that it was still quite acceptable for women to receive this Ehi Bhikkhuni ordination. And then when she was fully ordained, she saw a little bit of water, cleaning my feet, discerning that some water splashed up, some spilled down. Then at the time I realized all conditioned things are like that. Then my heart was liberated altogether without clinging. Then the victor dubbed me foremost of those with quick intuition. And then there are a few more stock verses where she rejoices in her attainments and superpowers. So uh, here we see, um, Straight after her full ordination, she, or pretty much pretty fast after her full ordination, she saw a little bit of water while she was cleaning her feet. And, why she, and then she realized impermanence. And at that moment, she was liberated. She attained arahanship. So within, let's say, a few minutes or maybe an hour or a few hours after her full ordination, she uh, became an arahant. And for that reason, she was named the foremost of those with quick intuition who quickly attained arahanship. Um, and also we see that image of uh, washing one's feet and contemplating that and attaining arahanship based on that. That's an image we have already encountered two weeks ago when we talked about Patachara and Patachara's poems. And that was one of the images that Patachara used uh, that, uh, based on which Patachara became fully enlightened and which um, her students then also picked up and played with this imagery. Uh, so it seems that Padakunala Kisa and uh, Patachara had a very similar uh, path towards full enlightenment uh, with that same um, incident, uh, washing one's feet, triggering um, the final breakthrough. 
to arahanship. So uh, this is the Apadana story of uh, Bada Kundala Kesa, where she is, she becomes already a little bit more removed from the Buddha. And now we are going to look at her um, commentary story from the Dhammapada commentary, as I mentioned, written by Buddha Gosa about a thousand years after the Buddha. And this story is very long, so I have very dramatically shortened it because I'm mostly interested in that part which leads up to her full ordination and then what happens around her ordination and her attainment of arahanship. Um, and all the introductory parts where she falls in love with the robber and marries and then the, he tries to kill her, but she kills him instead. And then she goes forth among the non-Buddhist nuns. All this I have left out. But if you want to look it up, that um, text is freely available on the internet. Um, anyway, it's, it's very similar to her story in the Apadana. So I, I don't think you're missing much now. But anyway, she goes forth among the non-Buddhist nuns, very likely the Jain nuns, she learns their teaching. And then at that point, the story picks up here now. And when, had, when she had mastered the thousand articles of faith, they said to her, you have a quiet proficiency. Now go throughout the, the, the length and breadth of Jambudipa, that is India, and look for someone able to match question and answer with you. So placing a branch of rose apple in her hands, they dismissed her with these words, go forth, sister. If anyone who is a layman is able to match question and answer with you, become his slave. If any monk enter his sangha as a nun, no one was able to match question and answer with her. In fact, such a reputation did she acquire that whenever men heard the announcement, here comes the nun of the rose apple, they would run away. So she was a very scary woman and scared all the men away. Before entering a town or village for arms, she would scrape a pile of sand together before the village gate and there plant her rose apple branch. Then she would issue her, ch her challenge. Let him that is able to match question and answer with me trample this rose apple branch under his feet. So saying, she would enter the village. No one dared to pass beyond that spot. When one branch withered, she would procure a fresh one. Traveling about in this way, she arrived at Savati, planted the branch before the city gate, Issued her, challenge in the <coughs> <coughs> issued her challenge in the usual way and went in to seek arms. A number of young boys gathered about the branch and waited to see what would happen. Then the venerable Sariputta said, go ahead boys, trample that branch under your feet. When the nun returned, she asked, venerable, did you tell them to trample my branch under their feet? Yes, sister. Well then, match question and answer with me. Very well, I will do so. The nun said to the venerable, Venerable, I wish to ask you a question. Ask it, sister. So she asked him the thousand articles of faith. Every question the nun asked, the venerable answered correctly. Then he said to her, I will ask you just one. Will you answer me? Ask your question, venerable. Then the venerable asked her, What is one? She said to herself, This is a question I should be able to answer. But not knowing the answer, she inquired of the Venerable, what is it, Venerable? This is the Buddha's question, sister. Tell me also the answer, Venerable. If you will enter our Sangha, I will tell you the answer. Very well, admit me to the Sangha. The Venerable sent word to the nuns and had her admitted. After being admitted to the Sangha, she made it her full profession, took the name Kundalakesa, and after a few days, became an arahant, endowed with the supernatural faculties. So I think, uh, as you can see, it's, it's very obvious. Her story has been dramatically changed. Um, and of course, there is no more mention um, of anything even remotely similar to the Ehi Bhikkhuni ordination. So we see at this point, is Bada Kundala Kisa has no longer even any kind of encounter with the Buddha himself. The only person she encounters is the Venerable Sariputta. And even when she has the ordination, even after the ordination, she has no contact whatsoever with the Buddha. So that that heart-to-heart -heart connection that she had in her poem is entirely removed here. 
And that's quite consistent with the thinking of, of the later times where uh, it is often believed that nuns did not have access to the Buddha, which of course is not something that we see at all in the early texts. So in the early texts, it's quite clear that the nuns had, had totally had access to the Buddha. And we have a large number of stories actually where nuns um, go and talk to the Buddha in various ways. But for example, also in Vinaya texts, it's quite common that nuns do not have access to the Buddha. So if something happens and a new rule needs to be laid down, then um, it's quite common that the nuns go to the monks and the monks go to the Buddha. So the nuns don't have direct access to the Buddha. That's something that's very, very common in later tradition. Um, and again, here we see um, also Bada Kundala Kesa's agency is very much removed. She no longer makes the decision to ordain herself. It is Sariputta who who pushes her to ordain, who blackmails her a little bit because she wants to know the answer to a question. So he puts that condition on her, you have to enter the Sangha, then I'll tell you the answer. So it's no longer, I mean, it's still her own choice in some way, but in some way it's also Sariputta pushing her. And she's not entirely um, making that request out of her own choice. So <clears throat> that agency is also removed from her. Of course, uh, she's not ordained by Ehi Bikoni, she's ordained by the nuns. And um, also her name, Kundalakesa, here she takes the name Kundalakesa after her Buddhist ordination, which of course doesn't make any sense because, uh, as I mentioned, Kundalakesa means curly hair and is a reference to the Jain ordination ceremony where they ripped out her hair and then it grew back in curls, and therefore she was called curly hair. The Buddhist ordination ceremony isn't like this. So we just shave our heads. So um, yeah, to take on the name curly hair at that point doesn't really make any sense. And then also the attainment of arahantship uh, for her takes a few days. And still she is the one foremost in, in swiftness of wisdom, which then becomes a little bit weird because we have stories of men, like many other, both monks and nuns who become arahants within uh, seven days, for example. So it's, of course, that's remarkable, that's great, but it's not that outstanding that you would name her foremost for that. And we, we saw in the early text, especially in her Abhadana, we could see quite clearly it took her after her full ordination a few, maybe a few minutes or a, or a few hours, however long it takes her to go back to a dwelling where she needs to wash her feet. Um, and then she becomes full enlightened. Um, but to have that last a few days, um, then sort of takes away from her foremost quality. So basically all the special things about her life, that heart-to-heart -heart connection she had with the Buddha, that immediate mutual recognition, um, all that is taken away and also the, the fastness of her attainment, the swiftness of her attainment is also taken away in this story. And of course, the Ehi Bikuni ordination is taken away from her here. So, um, these are the three party sources I wanted to go through today. Uh, we see uh, how her story evolves over time. And now um, to finish up, I would like to show you her story in the Ekotra Agama. Um, <clears throat> it's not a very long story, so I think we can just uh, go through it and then talk about it. And the story goes as follows. At that time, Kundala Kesa Bikuni was a respected Bharata woman. So just a quick disclaimer here, this word that I have translated Bharata is a transliteration in Chinese, and I'm not entirely sure that I have reconstructed it correctly. I think it is this, um, it means Bharata, um, and I, if it doesn't mean that, I don't know what, it el what else it could mean. Uh, but yeah, I'm just not 100% certain, but it also doesn't matter for the rest of her story. If it does mean Bharata, then Bharata could either be the name of a clan in India, or in, in later times, Bharata also came to be used uh, as a name for India in general. So then the text would say that she was an Indian woman. And if it says that, then that points us to the fact that this text was not composed in India, but at a point when uh, Buddhism had already moved outside India. Um, anyway, the Bikoni thought, I heard that the world honored one will become extinguished soon, and the number of his days have been exhausted. 
It is proper now to go to the world on at once, to meet with him and greet him. Then that Bikuni left Vesali and went to the world on at one. He saw from afar that the Tathagata led the Bikusanga and 500 youths down a narrow path and wanted to go to the twin trees. So the twin trees obviously is a reference to the twin Sala trees, the place where the Buddha attained final Parinibbana. Um, so we see um, <coughs> whereas in the Pali text, her story is set at a very, very early time in the Buddha's dispensation. In this Chinese version, her story is set at the latest possible point in time that it could be said, set just before the Buddha's Parinibbana. So the story already begins very differently. <coughs> oh, sorry, having trouble with my voice today. <clears throat> okay, I think it's okay now. Then the Bikuni went to the world honored one, paid respect with her head at his feet and said to the world honored one, I heard that the world honored one will become extinguished soon. The world honored one said the Tathagata's extinguishment will indeed be today at midnight. Then the Bhikkhuni said to the Buddha, I've gone forth to train in the path, but not attained my goal. Before the world honored one abandons me and becomes extinguished, may he teach the profound Dhamma and make me attain my goal. The Buddha said, you should now contemplate the origin of suffering. The Bhikkhuni again said to the Buddha, it is truly suffering, world honored one. It is truly suffering, Tathagata. The Buddha said, which topics do you contemplate that you call suffering? The Bhikkhuni said to the Buddha, birth is suffering, old age is suffering, sickness is suffering, death is suffering, worry and distress are suffering, association with what one dislikes is suffering, separation from what one likes is suffering. In short, the five aggregates of clinging are suffering. In this way, world honored one, I've contemplated these topics and therefore I call them suffering. When the Bikuni had contemplated these topics on that seat, she attained the three penetrative knowledges. So these are the Te Vija in Pali, the three knowledges, which are recollection of past life, um, seeing beings uh, being reborn according to their Kamma, and also the knowledge of the destruction of the taint. So destruction of the defilement, which means arahanship. And then the bhikkhuni said to the Buddha, I can't bear to witness the world honored one's extinguishment. Please allow me to become extinguished first. Then the Buddha consented in silence. So um, here the Buddha tells her to contemplate the origin of suffering. Um, and um, she does that in some way, but it's very interesting because this passage that we see here, um, this is obviously a stock passage. This is exactly the same in all Buddhist traditions, including the Pali tradition. This is the definition of suffering um, ever since the first sermon of the Buddha. But it's interesting that the Buddha tells her to, to contemplate the second noble truth, the origin of suffering, but she instead contemplates the first noble truth, suffering itself. So the text is a little bit contradictory here. Uh, and it seems like it does seem a little bit messed up here in this text, internally inconsistent, um, which again points us to the fact that this might not be a very early text. Um, um, anyway, and then we encounter this idea again that as a woman, as a bhikkhuni, she doesn't want to witness the world on a one's extinguishment. So she doesn't want to, to be, be around for the Buddha's Parinibbana and she enters Parinibbana first, which of course is something that we've seen many times. Uh, is a, a kind of like a stock passage for sort of, for Bhikkhuni text sort of, uh, modeled after Mahapajapati's uh, Apadana story. Um, and of course, uh, contradicts the Pali version, the, uh, her own poem in the Tirigata, where we clearly see that she's around for 50 years so she survives the Buddha's Parinibbana. Uh, but here the Buddha consents to her request, and then the bhikkhuni got up from her seat, paid respect to the world on a, on, paid respect at the world honored, world honored one's feet, 
and right in front of the Buddha, she flew up in the air and performed the 18 transformations, walking, sitting, and also doing walking meditation, emitting smoke and fire from the body, raising and sinking freely without obstructions, emitting water and fire, and filling up the entire sky. When the bhikkhuni had performed countless transformations, she became extinguished in full extinguishment without remainder, so Parinibbana. And on the day of her extinguishment, 80,000 gods attained the purification of the Dhamma eye. So that is stream entry. So again, this mirrors closely Mahapajapati's Appadana story, where she also performs all these miracles before she passes away. And then the world on at one told the bhikkhus, among my disciples, the foremost bhikkhuni in swiftness of wisdom is this Kundala bhikkhuni. So the quality is still the same, which allows us to conclude that this is supposed to be, this is not just another bhikkhuni with the same name, but this is supposed to be the same early disciple as the Bada Kundala, Kundala Kesa that we have seen all along in the Pali tradition, because they have this same quality of being foremost in swiftness of wisdom. Um, and we see, again, that is sort of a little bit inconsistent with the rest of the story, because here uh, um, she said to the Buddha, I have gone forth, out of, forth to train in the past, but not attained my goal. So that means she has been a bhikkhuni for a while already, but she hasn't attained anything. And only when the Buddha suddenly tells her about uh, to contemplate the second noble truth, which obviously she must have known all along, since this is kind of a basic thing that you, you probably would learn very early on as a bhikkhuni, only then does she make the breakthrough. So for her to be called the swiftest in wisdom is a little bit weird if she, had, if she already was a bhikkhuni for a long time before, or for, for some time before that. So um, yeah, this story is, this story here obviously is very, very different from the Pali. And as I mentioned, it does seem internally a little bit inconsistent um, on, in, in a few um, respects, this uh, um, contradiction between contemplating the second noble truth and then she contemplates the first one, and also being the swiftest in wisdom when she has been a bhikkhuni for a long time. And generally, it seems like there were a lot of stock passages that were put together. Um, and one possible explanation for this is that of course, in the Pali tradition, we have the Terigata, which is the earliest strata of texts that go back to the Buddha's time. So when the Pali tradition evolved later literature, they had a basis to build um, the literature on, to evolve the stories from, um, because the poems of those monks and nuns were there. But we know that uh, the Tera and Terigata, the monks and nuns verses, were never translated into Chinese. And um of course and that could potentially mean that in the traditions on which the from which the chinese texts were translated so sanskrit or other prakrit of other schools that the tera and terigata were not very popular in these schools or maybe those texts had already been lost at that point in time um and for that reason they had to make up those stories basically in a vacuum and that's why they just put together a few stock passages and a few things that they found inspiring, such as the Buddha Parinibbana and Mahapajapati and ideas from Mahapajapati's story and put it all together, mixed in a little bit of the Four Noble Truths uh, and her foremost quality. And uh, with that, sort of her story was, was created. So if you have to do that uh, in a vacuum, of course, it's logical that you uh, fall back on stories that you find very inspiring, that are well known, that people can emotionally relate to and that you use them to construct the story of a foremost disciple because you want people to be emotionally connected to that foremost disciple and to be inspired by their life. Whereas in the Pali tradition, we did have those early texts and so um, they didn't have to be created in a vacuum. So uh, with this, I see I have gone over time already. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, I think uh, we're, going, we're going to finish up for today. So just to recap, we saw uh, Bada Kundala Kesa's story throughout a uh, different historical strata of text, and we saw how she got more and more removed from the Buddha and how her story got sort of more and more ordinary, all the special, uh, special things in, in her story, in her life, got more and more removed. And uh, then we compared with the Chinese text, 
which uh, portrays an entirely different story from what we have seen in the Pali. So at this point, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to either ask or type in the live chat. And yeah, let me know if you have any thoughts about the story. So while you think about your questions, um, there's another thing we need to discuss. Um, as I mentioned, we thought about having another session about the seven sisters in King Kiki's time, uh, which are all the foremost bhikkhunis in Gautama Buddha's time. And we have now gone through all of those bhikkhunis individually. So if we want to do a session about the seven sisters, then next time would be a good time. Um, the thing is, though, the stories about the Seven Sisters, they're very interesting to compare between the different Buddhist schools, but they are, there are no early sources. So this is very clearly a later text. Uh, it's very clearly fan fiction because people liked uh, the early Bikunis, so they made up stories about them. Um, so if we want to look at that, uh, that's fine. I'd be very happy to prepare if you're interested. Um, but there aren't any texts that go back to the Buddha's time. So this is very early, very clearly um, not something that is originally Buddhist. Um, so you can think about whether you want to have that session or not. And I just saw that some people have uh, typed some things into the chat. I didn't see that before. Sorry, Sabamita, I didn't notice. Uh, Sabamita says, where do we find these miracles? So the miracles are found in the commentarial stories. Uh, I'd have to look it up. I can send you an email. And Sabamita says, to which Dhammapada verse is uh, this the commentary? Let me check. Um, Uh, verses 102 and 103. Um, and Cindy asks, are there any Chinese translations of the Terigata? No, there are no, no Chinese translations of either the Terigata or the Teragata, the monks and nuns verses. So it seems that they were never translated into Chinese. We have uh, mentions of the collections in Chinese texts. So there are Chinese texts that, that tell us that Tera and Terigata existed in the um, original languages from which the Chinese, Chinese texts were translated. So either Sanskrit or Prakrit texts. So those schools um, seem to have had original, seem to originally have had the Tera and Terigata, but they didn't make it, they were not translated into Chinese. And so nowadays they are lost. And the only versions that we have of the Tera and Terigata are the Pali versions. Any other questions? Okay, maybe we can do a show of hands uh, for people who want to have a session about the Seven Sisters. Then please raise your hand. Okay, Gillian and Anne-Marie and Esther and Dana. So I think that's the majority. So I hope all the others uh, will, will not be too disappointed. I hope it's okay for, for, for okay, Sabomita is also okay with that. So if that means that next time we will have a session about the Seven Sisters and uh, all the other sessions we get uh, pushed back one week. So I'm not going to cancel any, I'm not going to replace any other session, but we're just going to do that one week later. And uh, the thing about uh, the stories about the Seven Sisters is that apart from the Pali sources, all the other sources are like the non-Pali texts have not been translated into English. They have been translated into French and they have been translated into German. Uh, so we are going to work with uh, non-English language texts, but of course I will provide translations, uh, spoken translations. I'm not going to type it all out.
So I hope that's okay for everybody. And on the other hand, that's a good chance for everybody who doesn't speak French and doesn't speak English to learn a little bit more about those texts because otherwise you can't really access the story. So I think uh, we can finish up at this point. Uh, as usual, we will finish with three sadhus. Feel free to join me if you want to. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And I hope to see you all next week again.